tell you means absolute nerd. So there's going to be some nerdy things that we talk about. But my passion is making sure now that we are likely to live much longer than the generations before us, how do we stay active and healthy during those years rather than in a convalescent home or someplace that we wouldn't really want to be if we don't have to? So that's what today's all about. And part of it, I'm not here to depress you. Last time I spoke about this with the group, they're like, oh, I am so depressed. That's not the idea. But just to help you understand how all of us change as we age and how that is going to impact how we make the best use of the healthcare system so that it works to our advantage and we stay healthy instead of ending up being over medicated and, and not doing so well. So I'm about medications, but good use of meds and meds that kind of keep you active. So today we're going to talk about how to get the most out of your health care visits. If you're like most people, you go to the doctor's office and it just goes so fast and you're like, well, what just happened? And you don't necessarily get all of your questions answered. So I've got some tips to try to help you get more out of those visits and then make sure that how to, why and how to make sure all of your providers, everybody that takes care of you knows exactly everything you take. And I would bet money that probably there's not a single person that takes care of you that truly knows everything you take. So we're gonna talk about why and how that is. And then understand how medicines change and why your use of medicine will change throughout your life. And then this is also pertinent if you've got young people at home you're taking care of, some things that, are, that happen specifically when we're younger. And if you've got aging parents that you're taking care of, some of the issues you might be dealing with there. And then know how, which medicines can make some of your activities unsafe. Because especially in your industry, you've got people out driving these really heavy trucks. What medicines are potentially hazardous and why? What, what makes a difference with those meds? So those are my objectives for today. So I have a question for you to get started. When you get ready for a doctor's visit, so your doctor says we've got an appointment next Tuesday, which of these things do you do? So how many of you show up at the appointed time and say, hey, I'm here? How many of you already write down and take with you a list of your meds? How many of you take a list of medicines and every other substance you take? Hardly anybody does that. Um, one person in particular showed me how that instead of writing it all down, each time they get a new prescription bottle, they take a picture and they keep it in a folder and so if any doctors or anybody asks what they take, they've got all their photos right there. I thought that was ingenious. Um, home readings. Does anybody have like a home blood pressure monitor or a blood sugar monitor? Or do you weigh yourself regularly and kind of track the changes? Any sort of data you take about yourself, do you take that to the doctor? Nope. And then... Do you think ahead, okay, I want to talk about this and ask that question and double check on that, and do you write those things down? Good. I'm hoping that your life will be revolutionized after we talk about this and you get a lot more out of your provider visits. So the first one is I am finding, and this is again after doing this for a couple of decades, very rarely, I keep moving, very rarely <laughs> does anybody know truly everything you take. And when I say everything you take, yes. Multivitamins. <laughs> right. That's all I take. Awesome. My, my doctor knows that unless it's life or death, I'm not going to take anything. You're not doing it. <laughs> but, okay, I have a challenging question for you. Do you ever take anything for an upset stomach or for heartburn? Mm -hmm. Never. No. Headache? Sprained no. ankle? No. No Tylenol in the cupboard you take just once no. in a while? No. Um, oh, you're rare. Mm -hmm. Herbals? Supplements? No. No. Just a and that's it? Yep. Awesome. I hope it always, always stays that way. So sometimes when you say medicines, people think about the prescription medicines. And even then, most people have more than one prescriber. So you've got like your main doctor, and then you've got any specialists or gynecologists or urologists or whatever that you see in, in addition. We all think that all of our doctors talk to each other and know what's going on, and unfortunately, that is typically not the case. 
So when I say prescription, I mean everything prescribed by everybody. But then we've got to think about the vitamins, and sometimes we don't think of those as medicine, and so your doctor may not know what vitamins you take. Over-the-counter medicines, and those might be just once in a blue moon. When I get a cold twice a year, I take NyQuil or whatever I take. But even those things are medicines that can interact with your prescription medicine. So all of those are important. Then there's supplements. So supplements can be like your omega-3s, or it can be um, the boost that you drink once in a while. Um, and then there's the herbal medicines. And again, a lot of people think, well, that's not medicine. That's natural. But those two are substances that can interact with other medicines and can have side effects. Tobacco. It's amazing how tobacco can impact how our body metabolizes or breaks down a lot of our medicines. There's all the holistic therapies that are out there, and even those are important. If it's part of, say, your overall pain regimen that you get acupuncture, all of your providers need to know that. It's important to that overall look at your care. Then there's marijuana. Um, this month, has it been released yet? This is the month that Maryland was to announce who the growers are going to be in the state and who the dispensers are going to be in the state. So any day now. And most of them estimated it will take nine months until they're up and running. So by March, their marijuana will be legal in this state. Um, medical marijuana, but they put very few restrictions on it. So pretty much marijuana will be legal in the state and available about March. So that's another medication that can interact. Welcome, men. How are you? What, no, no, no. We'll have to start talking less about gynecologists now. I'm more interested. <laughs> that's all right. And so we're talking about you've got a doctor visit coming up. How do you prepare for it? And a lot of times we just kind of let it happen. Okay, I need to be there Tuesday at 11 and you just kind of show up and there you are. But I think there are ways that you can prepare for these doctor visits and get a lot more out of them. So one of those is think about ahead of time what you want to talk about. And it could be something acute, you know, something that's going on right now. I, you know, I... I, last time I was here, I was wearing a boot and I think crutches and the whole deal because I ripped my calf muscle. So for a while, going to the doctor was all about my calf muscle. But there may be other things as well. Oh, by the way, somebody recommended I take this supplement. What do you think? Or um, I've had this funny mole pop up on me, my knee and should I have that looked at? So any of those things, while you've got the doctor's attention, think about what you want to talk about, but then prioritize them. I've had a couple of people that make a list of about 50 things, and sometimes the doctor doesn't have time for 50. So what are the most important ones? And then take two copies. And so you've got a list, ideally, of every medication, supplement, herbal, every substance that you take and how often you take it. You've already got that with you, so you don't have to remember when they ask. And you've got this list of things you want to talk about, and you take two copies. And the reason for that is that you're going to give one, oops, you're going to give one to the medical assistant who checks you in. Do you know what I mean? You sit in the waiting room and then they call you back and the medical assistant takes you in and like checks your blood pressure, verifies that it's you, does all that initial stuff. If you keep a copy for yourself and you give a copy to that MA, your doctor's down the hall seeing somebody else. When, they, when the MA leaves your room, they're going to go find the doctor, give the doctor that piece of information, your list of what you want to talk about, and then on the way back, the doctor's looking at that. So when the doctor walks in the room, it's not, oh, hi, how are you, why are you here today, what are we going to talk about? They know right off the bat exactly what you want to talk about and what your priority is. This is my most important thing. This is my second most important thing. I've had doctors and individuals, many of them, say that this has kind of revolutionized the way that they go to the doctor. Because now they walk in, everybody's on the same page, they know what they want to talk about, you're not pressured to remember what you wanted to talk about. I mean, 
tell me if you're different, but I know, especially when I take my kids, it feels like it's so busy when we're in the doctor's office and it goes so fast, and all of a sudden my mind goes blank. I know there was something I wanted to ask about or talk about, and I the pressure or the whatever, I completely forget. I leave, and I'm like, oh, you know, I don't want to make another appointment, but I missed my opportunity to talk about that. So I encourage you, think about what you want to do ahead of time. You go to the doctor, you take two copies. One is for you, take a pen, you can write down the answers. One is to give the doctor. The doctors appreciate it, takes the pressure off of you, and everything gets included in those few minutes you have with the doctor. Now another piece of this is how do you describe your symptoms? And I laugh because my husband went to the doctor a few months ago and he went in and he goes, oh, I've got pain in my stomach. That could be 50 different things. And so the poor doctor's trying to figure out what it is. You know, it could be this, it could be that. And about 20 minutes later, finally figures out what it is and orders the right test. But if he'd been a little more descriptive, she'd have known right off the bat. So some of the ways you can be more descriptive is figure out where, exactly where. Is it all of the stomach or was it like one spot? When did it start? Started yesterday, or it's been going off and on for the last two months. Makes a big difference in figuring out what it is. What makes it better? What have you tried that makes it better, and what makes it worse? So in his case, if he hadn't eaten anything in quite a while, he was fine. But when he ate, it would get worse. That was a key detail in figuring out what it was. What has he tried to treat it? Well, he had tried like antacids and he would tried Maalox and all that kind of stuff and it hadn't made any difference. That was a key detail to be shared. And then describe your symptoms. And that gets into the words you use make a big difference. So there's a difference between a sort of throbbing, achy pain and a sharp, stabbing pain or excruciating pain versus, well, kind of a nuisance pain. Is all this making sense? So the more specific you can be in describing, okay, I've got this going on, and this is when it started, and this is what makes it better, and this is what makes it worse, and you can be really descriptive, amazing how much more quickly your doctor hones in on what's going on, orders the right tests, and gets you the right treatment. Otherwise, it's sort of like a scavenger hunt. The way my, my poor dear husband went in with all my stomach hurts, it was like a scavenger hunt. This poor woman was asking him every question under the sun, trying to hone in on what was happening. So any questions about that piece of it, how just some minor changes in how we prepare for a doctor visit leads to better care and helps us walk out with a lot more valuable information when we leave. So now is the depressing part. I think it's important for all of us to know, everybody, as we age, what changes and why that changes some of our medical needs as we, as we age. So everybody ready? I say, I gave this talk yesterday and a bunch of people were like, oh, that was so depressing. Uh, that's not my intent. So here we go. Everybody at about in their 30s or 40s, the healthiest of people, your kidneys start to slow down ever so slightly, but they continue to slow down for the rest of your life. So your kidney function in your 80s is a lot different than your kidney function in your 40s. And again, that's if you're super duper healthy. If you've got other things going on that impact your kidneys, then it can decline even more. But even the super healthiest people we have to start changing doses of medicines in the 70s and 80s because the kidneys just don't work the same. Same with the liver. Usually it's closer to our 50s that the liver gradually starts to get a little smaller and there's a little bit less blood flow. And so the liver, which breaks down the medicine in the body, starts slowing down on its job and not quite as efficient as it was. Food and medicines go through the intestines more slowly. And so, it can take longer to get some medications absorbed, and then we're much more easily constipated as time goes by, so we've got to watch that. We've got to be try to be more active, eat fiber, and drink more. 
the volume of urine that the bladder can hold goes down. I live that every day. Anybody else have to stop by the potty a little more often than they used to? And that's a natural physiologic change. For men, the prostate gland increases. A lot of men start seeing that in their 50s, and usually by 80, every man is experiencing some symptoms of an enlarged prostate. For women, once menopause kind of comes and goes, our urethra shortens, and that's why women are have such a much higher incidence of urinary tract infections after menopause. Just, and again, these are just natural changes that occur for everybody. Our growth hormone levels decline, and so our muscles tend to get a little bit weaker. So if you were Arnold Schwarzenegger and you were lifting mega weights at 30, probably not going to lift the same amount at 60. Even if you try to keep up with your, your exercises, you're just not, your body and your muscles aren't going to be as responsive. Also, the aldosterone, which is a, um, it's a hormone in the body that kind of works at the level of the kidneys and it determines how much water is kept in the body and how much water is released from the body. It changes and we tend to have less total water in our body and we get dehydrated more easily. So these super hot days when you're out and about, very important to drink plenty of water because the older we are, the more likely we're gonna get easily dehydrated. Our immune system slows down. And so we tend to get colds easier, you know, if we're exposed to the grandkids or whatever, we start to catch those things more easily. And it, they think it's why the incidence of cancer goes up as well, is the body just can't fight off those cancer cells as easily as it might have at other ages. The heart itself as a, as a muscle, it starts to get stiffer. And so whereas it would Normally when we're really young, we start to exercise more, our heart beats harder and it beats faster to keep up with our exercise. It just doesn't do it quite the same the older we get. And so our, the amount of exercise we can do before we get tired starts to go down. I'm almost done with the bad news. The muscles involved in breathing tend to decline. The, your lungs are kind of like an upside down tree. And so you've got the big branches at the top and it branches out throughout your lungs and at the bottom there are these teeny little sacs that are like tiny little balloons. And that's where when you breathe in, the oxygen goes down to those little sacs and the blood comes under them and the oxygen goes from the lungs into the blood. Those little sacs, some of them start to pop as we age. If we smoke, they pop faster. If we have certain pulmonary diseases, they pop faster. But even the healthiest of people, we just have fewer of those little sacs as time goes by, and so we get shorter breath easier. And then the amount of water, total water in your body goes down over time, which is why our skin gets dry a lot easier, our eyes kind of get dry, our mouth gets dry, and it's also why we dehydrate, get dehydrated so much easier. And then sometimes our senses start to change a little bit. So if your vision starts to go, as I was talking earlier, I've got new um, progressive lenses. So if I'm looking all funny, it's because I can only see some of you if my head's tilted just right. So I'm still trying to figure out how these glasses work. But um, our vision tends to decline over time. Our focus vision, our up close vision tends to get worse so that we start doing this. <laughs> and then our, if like I've always had trouble with distance vision and that's actually starting to get a little bit better, which is a sign that my eyes are weakening. That's what the eye doctor says. So vision tends to change. From a pharmacist perspective, that means keeping track of all those little pills gets harder. And reading those little tiny labels can get harder. So it's easier to make mistakes with medication. As our hearing starts to go, it, um, for one thing, it's harder to hear instructions and get them clear and get them straight. But the other one is a lot of people start to isolate themselves when the hearing goes. They don't feel like they can participate in conversations as well. Even with hearing aids, sometimes too much noise is distracting and kind of confusing. And so 
I find that a lot of people, as the hearing starts to go, they just don't go out around other people as much as they did. It's all about hearing aids. Yep. I got one of the ears. When you have your hearing aids in and there's a lot of people talking, is it difficult to differentiate oh, yeah. sounds? Yeah. I don't think there are any hearing aids made right now that are really good at that. No. And so that's a really common complaint. So can I pick on you? Do you try to avoid crowds because of that? A little bit. Yeah, like Walmart on a Saturday, you're like, no, I'm not interested. I don't go to Walmart on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Even olfaction is your sense of smell. Smell and taste can have a big impact. When food doesn't smell good and we can't taste it, we don't tend to eat as much. And so a lot of times as those things start to go, people stop eating and their weight changes tremendously. So as a pharmacist, I'm thinking about doses of medicines because it's different when our weight is one thing versus another. And the last one is the sense of touch. And the big thing there is opening those darn pharmacy medicine bottles and getting the medicine out and not dropping them everywhere can get just manipulating the meds can be really difficult. I had a woman one time, she described taking her medicines in the morning as going fishing. Uh, you know, you're, in your head you're going, oh, this is not going to be good. And so she said that she had taken each of her bottles and I'm looking at the door jam. She put it in there and slammed the door so that the lid would pop off. And then she had dumped all of her medicines into a bowl. So all of her medications are in a bowl together. And she knew that she was supposed to take, let's say, a pink one and two blues and a white. She'd lick her finger and she'd try to get the ones that she was supposed to take to stick to her finger. And however successful she was, that's the meds that she took that day. So we came up with a lot of better techniques for her. But that astounded me. So she would go fishing for her meds. Please don't do that. Don't walk away from this and say, well, she said I should just dump all my meds in the big bowl. <laughs> Medicines, interestingly enough, in some cases can make these worse. And when these things, when our senses aren't working well, our risk of falls goes way up. This is going to sound silly, but I hope you can relate. Even while my leg wasn't working, I don't know if it was because so much of my brain was focused on how to get around without killing myself on crutches and with, that, with my leg up off the ground. I, I felt like nothing else worked right either. It's like I didn't concentrate as well. I felt like I, I wasn't absorbing what was going on around me as well. I guess I was just really, really distracted, even with it was just my leg out of commission. Think about the last time you had a really bad cold and your ears were stopped up and how that impacted everything else. Probably impacted how you ate. It probably impacted how well you could hear what was going on around you. You didn't feel good, so it impacted kind of how your day went and how much you got done. So even little changes and things like this can have bigger impact on us and our overall function. So I want to explain a little science for a minute. And I'm trying not to bore you to tears, but I just want you to understand why it's such a big deal that we approach your medicine regimen or anybody's medicine regimen differently 60 plus than we did maybe in the 20s. And so a part of that is what the body does to the medicine. When we take a medicine, what happens inside of there that causes the medicine to work? And we call those kinetic changes or pharmacokinetic changes. So what the first one is absorption. How does the medicine get into the body so that it can do what it needs to do? Aging itself really doesn't impact that, but a lot of people right now are on acid suppressing medicines. So like Prilosec and Protonix and Prevacid, those kind of meds. Um, studies have shown that like a huge percentage of adults take those medicines. Well, those impact the amount of acid in your stomach which impacts the absorption of medicines. So your using those stomach medicines is very important for your doctor to know because it could impact the dose of the other medicines that you need. And then if you stop taking the, uh, the stomach medicine, then your dose of other things might be too high and need to be adjusted with it. Does that make sense? Then there's distribution. 
So me some medicines are very fat loving. So in the phases of our life when we are fluffier, our medicine kind of goes everywhere. It has more places to go and it can last longer. It takes longer to get it back out. For some medicines love water and as we age, we have less water in our body. So the same dose of medicine is more concentrated. Remember back to chemistry where you've got less water and the same amount of medicine. And so it's all that medicine's bunched up in there. And so as we age, we need less of some of these medicines, especially the water loving medicines, to have the same effect as we did when we were younger. This is my breakdown picture. Has anybody ever seen a little toddler have a breakdown? <laughs> so metabolism is the breakdown. How is the medicine broken down in the body? And the liver is the organ that has a whole bunch of different enzymes in it. And certain enzymes are specific to certain medicines. Try not to make this too, too crazy, complicated. But when two medicines that are um, broken down by the same enzyme are taken together, sometimes one of them will make the other one's effect even greater. So like more likely to be toxic. Sometimes one of them is like the bully and it makes the effect of the other one less and sometimes they compete. So that there's only so many enzymes and two medicines half go to one medicine and half go to the other. And what that means is sometimes the medicine is broken down more slowly so the same dose has a much bigger effect either more toxic or it lasts a whole lot longer. So an example, oh, let me show you the, the last part and then I have an example. Oh, and there are actually some enzymes in the liver that don't even work in little kids. And so there are some medicines that are never given to children because they just can't, their liver can't break it down. There are other enzymes that kind of peter out later in life. And so there are some medicines that we should never ever give to people that are like 80 plus because the liver no longer deals with those medicines correctly. So my example is coming. The last one's excretion. So the medicine is, has been gotten into the body. It's gone where it's going, whether it goes to the fat or it goes to the water. It's gone to the liver to be broken down and now it has to get back out. And so it usually goes out through the feces or through the urine. And we know that now our renal function, our kidney function starts to go down after our 30s or 40s. So those medicines going out through the urine are gonna go out more slowly because the kidney's getting rid of them not as efficiently as it used to. And then medical conditions like diabetes can make our kidney function even worse. Some medicines can make our kidney function worse. And then there are other, other conditions and events that can negatively impact our kidneys. So for instance, there's a gentleman, I just looked at his medicine <coughs> regimen about three hours ago. He's had diabetes for a really long time. He's on several medicines to protect his kidneys, but he also takes ibuprofen or Motrin, which a lot of us take for pain, but that's actually really hard on his kidneys. And so over the counter, no big deal. He just kind of picked it up, thought it was no big deal, but he really needs to stop taking the ibuprofen so that his kidneys have a fighting chance with the diabetes and such that are already impacting them. My other example, diazepam or Valium. Has anybody ever heard of that drug? Mm -hmm. That is my number one most hated drug in the universe. I hate Valium for a lot of reasons, but one of them is it's highly reliant on the liver to break it down, and it heavily relies on the kidneys to get rid of it. And there's a gentleman that I've been seeing who's 78 years old, not that, not that old, old these days, you know, anticipated to live a whole lot longer, but yet his kidneys aren't working like they did in his 20s. <laughs> He's on Valium twice a day. In somebody in their 20s or 30s, a single dose of Valium will last anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. In his case, a single dose will probably last about three days. He's taking it twice a day. So that first dose isn't even near gone when the next dose is taken, and neither of those doses are gone when the next dose is taken. <coughs> so 
Um, Valium is a medicine that's used kind of for nerves and to calm people down. So why do you suppose he does all the time? Mm -hmm. His family says he's not motivated, but the poor guy zonked out on Valium. So one of the doctors told him to take no dose. <laughs> oh my gosh, no! Get rid of the Valium. But it was a great example of how kind of one side doesn't know what the other side's doing. You know? <coughs> and it's because of his age and the way things are kind of starting to decline that he in particular is having this reaction to the Valium. My toilet is starting to scratch. When does his respiratory <coughs> function shut down? Um, not so much with Valium. That happens with the opiates, with the narcotics. And I know you've seen the, the explosion of overdose deaths. I mean, it's... It's terrifying. Actually, I was um, earlier at the rescue mission over in Westminster where the men are trying to kind of overcome that and talking about what a battle that is because that addiction is just so much a part of who you are and it's so powerful and trying to find ways to get past that. It's a, well, it's a lifelong struggle. So last little piece. Medicines and how they can impact your thinking. And all the preamble was to say that a large part of why we react the way we do to medicines has to do with all of those changes that are happening in our body. And so over time, these medicines cause even more trouble. <coughs> so in general, medicines that actually help your thinking would be anything that enhances your heart function, your blood flow, your breathing, and medicines that treat depression, because <coughs> depression very closely mimics it. It looks like dementia. So you think, oh my goodness, my memory is slipping, but it might actually be depression, which is very common, unfortunately, in this crazy society that we live in right now. And so treating depression can actually help you think more clearly. And the other one is thyroid function. So if anybody's thyroid is not well controlled, that can impact their thinking as well. But now we'll get to the medicines that can actually hinder or cloud your thinking. So one of them is medicines for anxiety or nerves, and that gets into these benzodiazepines. So diazepam or Valium, Xanax, and Ativan. These medicines, they do calm you, but they do that by kind of slowing down all the neurotransmitters in your brain. So you're calmer and more relaxed but your ability to react quickly is also slowed way down. So it makes it dangerous to drive or to climb ladders or to do those sorts of things while on these medicines. Similarly, the older depression medicines were very drying and tended to cause a lot more confusion. Those are like um, amitriptyline or Elevil, some of those older ones did that. Sleep medicine kind of makes sense. So if a medicine makes you sleep, then it's going to make you sleepy and harder to think clearly. Some sleep medicines act really quick and they're kind of out of your body by morning and you're, you're okay. But some of them last a while. So if you, if you take a sleep medicine and the next morning you're still feeling groggy, I would encourage you to either try to sleep without a medication or to talk to your doctor about one of the quick ones so it's gone by morning. Pain gets into the narcotics or the opioids. Those can certainly cloud your thinking. Seizure medicine, now pros and cons, you absolutely, if you've got a seizure disorder, you need your seizure medicine. But we can work to make sure you're on the lowest possible dose to minimize some of the slowed thinking that comes with managing the seizures. And then nerve pain medicine, Neurontin or um, Lyrica, have you heard of those? Especially people with diabetes, but a lot of other nerve conditions, fibromyalgia, other conditions, they use it. <coughs> I had a woman once, perfectly functional, 81 years old, started on Neurontin 300 milligrams, which is what you would start a 20 year old on, but she was 81, started it, went to the mall, somebody pulled out in front of her, as people tend to do at the mall, she went to press on the brake, and instead pressed on the gas, but because her thinking was slowed down, by the time she realized it, she'd actually launched her car on top of the other car somehow. Made the newspaper, she was really embarrassed. Everybody was fine. 
but it was all a starting dose of medicine. You don't start an 81 year old on that dose of medicine. And then the other big list of medicines that draw, that, that hinder your thinking are what we call anticholinergic. And I want you to think of the desert and really, really dry. So these medicines, dry stuff. So medicines for vomiting or for diarrhea or for st um, mm -hmm. some stomach upset, for congestion and colds and flu. Those sorts of medicine tend, because of what they do, they're very drying, but they also really cloud thinking. So I only have one more. Over-the-counter sleep aids. I mean, they're over-the-counter, so you think, oh, they're perfectly safe. Most of these nighttime Tylenol PM, Advil PM, the, the sleeping agent is Benadryl, diphenhydramine. And it's another one. It um, causes the drying, but it really kind of clouds the thinking. And it's the number one medicine that's caused the most nighttime falls in people. Because you think, oh, I can't sleep, so I'm going to take this. And then a bladder doesn't work like it used to. So you get up in the middle of the night. It's dark. You've got different footwear than normal. And you're walking around. And that's when people have had the falls that really change the rest of their life. So if you're having trouble sleeping, actually probably the safest thing to try is melatonin. Um, because it's not going to have all the sedating side effects. And so if you, if you really need something, consider talking to your provider about melatonin over some of the other options. All right, so our goals were how to get the most out of your health care visit. So how many copies of your information are you going to take? Two. Two copies. I swear to you it'll make a big difference. I encourage you to try it. Make sure everybody knows everything you take, not just the prescriptions, but everything. I've got stories about that too, if anybody wants to stay and hear them. <laughs> Understand why the medicines, why our medicines need to be reevaluated at various stages as we age, and why our doses and our needs will be different. And then know how medicines can actually impact the safety of your function, and certain medicines in particular can really kind of cloud your thinking. So those are my words of wisdom. <coughs> Apologize for the coughing. Are there any questions I can answer? Or I can, you can, you can ask them. We'll see if I can answer them. Blood pressure meds, do they cause uh, fuzzy thinking? Not usually, no. but they can make you, when you go from like sit down to stand right. up, they can make you kind of woozy in that That's respect. Yeah, I gotta get mine changed because that's if I pass out every time I stood up real quick. A piece of that is make sure you're drinking plenty. Mm -hmm. But the other one, um, especially beta blockers, so like metoprolol, atenolol, carvedilol, those are used. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, toprol, tenormin, and coreg. Those medicines in particular, the reason they work, and they use them for blood pressure, and they use them after heart attacks is they, they keep your heart from beating too fast and from beating too hard, which protects your heart, especially if it's been damaged in any way. It allows it to kind of continue to function and not overdo it. But it means when you're trying to exercise like you used to, you won't be able to because your heart can't respond like it used to. So that'll make you feel dizzy when you, when you try to overdo it. Other questions? Oh, I apologize. Yes, I have a hand up for.